from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, time for caution on tech or time to go all in? Longtime tech analyst Mark Mahaney tells us which way he thinks the roller coaster is heading. Plus, the U.S. Supreme Court's conservative justices skeptical about President Biden's push to get more people vaccinated, even as Omicron continues to spread. We will have the latest. And how the tech industry's attempt to simplify the process of selling a house ended up creating a secret pipeline for big investors to snatch properties away from middle class buyers. We'll get to all of that in a moment. But first, the U.S. starting the new year with a disappointing jobs report, adding far fewer than expected. Unemployment did drop below 4 percent, though, and wages rose slightly, meaning the economy is getting back to normal. And the focus now is on inflation. It is a confusing report. I'm not quite sure if it's a complete all clear here. This report suggests that the economy has normalized to a great extent. There's nothing in the report that will change what the Fed signaled. All of the signals are that the labor market is tightening. The job market is normalized to a great extent. We're still moving along around uh, around a full employment dynamic. That should all else equal means that the Fed should normalize its monetary policy. The Fed cannot escape the inflation issue. It's all about inflation which is really getting the Fed nervous. The presumption is absolutely they hike. They're going to chase this thing and they're going to hike uh, pretty aggressively. Three, four rate hikes on the table. The March rate hike is definitely a go. The reaction of our guests on Bloomberg Television throughout the day. Let's see how markets reacted and tech stocks taking another hit. Ed, take it away. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that data did not do anything to change the psychology that rate hikes are coming earlier and they're coming faster from the Federal Reserve. The tech route deepened, the Nasdaq 100, having its worst week actually since February of last year. Real selling pressure for high multiple stretch valuation tech stocks. The mega caps actually did slightly better on the day, down six tenths of one percent on the New York uh, NYSE Fang Plus index. And that selling also extending to semiconductors. Also in crypto as well, the Bloomberg Galaxy crypto index down 4%. It's lowest level since September. Of course, a big constituent of that is Bitcoin, which we'll talk about later in the show, dropping down below the $41,000 per token level. Coming with me is my Bloomberg terminal. There's two stocks I want to focus in on here. Alphabet, the Google parent, and Microsoft. They both had their worst week since March 2020, Emily. In other words, their worst week since prior to the da pandemic really taking hold here in the United States. But you have to remember, these are two stocks that really were outperformers in the context of mega caps in 2021. But as yields have come up and that narrative around the Fed has gained traction, there has been some selling pressure there. One winner of the week, Emily, can you guess? Mm. Meme stocks. <laughs> Meme stocks. Any surprise there? This all started around reports on GameStop moving into NFTs and crypto. The stock up 7% Friday, AMC, which has also already disclosed right its ambitions for activity in the crypto space, following suit. The GameStop, uh, the, the meme stock kind of index actually up for the week, so outperforming broader technology space. And the final one I want to point out is the DSPAC index. This is a Bloomberg custom index of the highest profile stocks that went public via a special purpose acquisition company, down 14% on the week. Ouch. All right. Ed, ouch indeed. Thank you. I want to stick with tech investing in the outlook for 2022 with Evercore's Mark Mahaney, his firm out with new research saying now is the time for caution and taking a muted stance on high growth tech stocks. Mark, back with us now. Mark, good to have you back. So is this the year the tech bubble pops? Well, at least for the high multiple stakes uh, stocks, as Ed was just pointing out, the, here's the quick quip on what we've seen so far year to date. Price, uh, stocks with price to sales multiples of 10x have I have traded off 10% at least, um, you know, year to date. I know we only have five trading days in the in the year so far, but yeah, if you have aggressively rising interest rates, and that's the new, that's really the new new thing for tech investors this year. That wasn't the case in either of the last two, three, or four years. You got rising uh, interest rates. Those high multiple stocks are going to be the hardest to 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 be long, to be long with. That's why we're steering. You know, our top picks are ones that we think there's very reasonable valuation, or there's kind of a reopening catalyst, or there's something really specific in terms of a product catalyst or a, or, a, or a business model catalyst for the stock. You have to be more selective this year than most. 
Now, we saw rising rates in March and October of last year. Both times, tech stocks sold off, but then picked back up again. Is this just another mini dip, or is this more long term? Oh, I, I don't know, Emily. That's the, the honest answer. You're asking the right question. We know that uh, we're going to have three or four hikes. We, know, we quote unquote know that we're going to have those hikes. It's just this is going to be we are going to have we haven't had any hikes yet. We are going to have more. We're going to have more hikes, therefore, than we've had in the last couple of years. And just for high multiple stocks, the reason why it matters is so much of the value in those stocks is kind of in the out years. And so if rates rise, you have to discount back those earnings five and 10 years out. You discount them at a higher level, they're worth less. And so that's uh, that's the challenge if you have a high multiple stock where most of the earnings are in the out years. And usually those are the same things. Uh, the, 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 the companies that are generating a lot of earnings this year, right here, right now, they trade in much lower, much more reasonable multiples, whether that's a Microsoft, an Apple, a Google, or a Facebook. You mentioned Microsoft and Google, Microsoft and Alphabet having their worst week since the start of the pandemic, but you've got pri high price targets and outperforms on both. Why? Yeah, well, our top picks here, just to be clear about this, Amazon, Facebook, and uh, and Uber. So I'll go with Facebook. There's two major fixes, I think, or there are two, there are two problems that I think they can quote unquote fix this year. First, one of the big issues on this stock isn't uh, high interest rates, it's uh, IDFA or the Apple privacy uh, changes. If and I think uh, if Facebook can chat, can fix that and come up with a, a successor, what we call a son of or a daughter of IDFA, a child of IDFA, a marketing solution that that marketers can use that's got that's got attribution that almost as good as what you had prior to the Apple policy changes, I think you'll see advertising money come back quickly to Facebook. The other one is I think they can address part of this ESG discount that Facebook has faced because of the Facebook files last year. And if they can start addressing some of that, at least some of that gap, some of that discount can be narrowed. So that's one of the reasons why I like Facebook for this year. But what about Microsoft and Google then, given that they've had such a rough week? Yeah, I'll punt on, uh, on Microsoft, uh, but on Google, uh, Google Web, I like as a stock. Fabulous year last. Just, I just think there's less upside. I'm trying to find stocks that are more dislocated. I don't find um, uh, Google right now particularly dislocated. I think there's just more upside on names that have had challenges this last year. That's where Amazon, Uber, and Facebook fall in. Google's fine as a long-term stock, just less upside after phenomenal performance last year. And what about Twitter? New leadership, and still the stock just hasn't recovered for years. It hasn't, and I think the major problem here has been lack of successful product innovation at the company. They have been a, they have not been able to consistently and successfully ship new product, new features to both consumers and to advertisers, and particularly on the advertiser side. And maybe that'll change under current management, uh, but I think we should all be skeptical until we really see evidence of that. That that's always been the issue, I think, for Twitter. Frankly, for the last five years, I don't know why they've had the problems. I assume it's personnel, the, the people running the company, and maybe having a part-time CEO. I don't think that's a bad explanation for why they've had product development problems, but they have, mm -hmm. and that's why the stock hasn't worked. All right, looking out then, what does the shape of the COVID recovery look like to you? Oh, I don't know. Hopefully, and it I is hope a recovery. It's, uh, <laughs> exactly. Hopefully, it's a recovery. All, all I would say is, I, I, you know, I'm. My guess is as good as yours on that. I hope there's a recovery. But I will say, if there is a recovery, the name I like most in the coverage group that I have is the company with the most upside, and that's Uber. We still have 40, they're still 40% below pre-COVID levels. So, you know, we all need to be commuting once again back to work, and we need to do these business trips again. And that may not happen fully this year, probably won't, but I, I don't know. But if it does happen, you know, the best recovery name is either travel names or the ride sharing names. It's just that the travel names have already re-rated. They're already trading as if COVID is over where you don't have that with the ride-sharing names. I call it a trough multiple stock on not really trough earnings, but on depressed earnings. So I think there's the most upside in a name like Uber if COVID, if we really do move beyond uh, COVID this year. Interesting. What about regulatory risks for Uber and for some of these big tech names that we're talking about? I mean, obviously, regulation has been looming for a long time. Does that crescendo this year or not? Uh, well, one thing very specific on uh, uh, Uber, back in 2020, you'll remember Prop 22 passed here in California, major positive catalyst for Uber. In the middle of 2021, that was reversed by a federal judge, it was a federal or state judge. That decision comes up for renewal, uh, for review 
next month. So it's possible that reversal will itself be reversed. So that gets this starting to get starting to get complicated. But anyway, there's the potential here for a positive catalyst because I, my guess is that it's going to be hard not for Prop 22 to become the law of the land, given how overwhelmingly that was voted for. And then in terms of the big tech regulation, I think that's just going to be an overhang. I, that, that's, that's a permanent overhang on these names. And at the very least, you're going to find one of those growth arrows that these companies need or they've used a lot in the past, large scale acquisitions, that's just off the table. So at some level, you know, we should have slightly diminished growth outlooks for all of the major tech companies because big, big acquisitions not, no longer going to be allowed. All right, Mark Mahaney, Uber, interesting. We'll be watching in 2022. Mark, always good to have you. Thank you, Evercore ISI. Well, the controversial social media app that helped fuel last year's meme stock frenzy, Reddit, is said to be going public as early as March. Sources say the company is working with Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs on the IPO, which could value Reddit at as much as $15 billion. The company was valued at $10 billion by investors in a funding round last summer. Coming up, the fight over vaccine mandates. Citibank telling employees no vaccine, no job, while the Supreme Court is casting doubt on whether 80 million workers are actually required to take the shot. That's all next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Well, as the pandemic drags on, a hint of optimism from President Biden. I don't think COVID is here to stay, but having COVID in the environment here and in the world is probably here to stay. But COVID, as we're dealing with it now, is not here to stay. The new normal doesn't have to be. We have so many more tools we're developing. So we hope. Comments from the president coming as a new study out of South Africa shows patients infected with the Omicron variant, less than 5% died during this current wave compared to 20% during other waves. This also showed after just a month, hospital admissions declined and that fewer people were admitted to the ICU. Despite that optimism, though, the virus is still spreading and mandates are still to be implemented, including an ongoing fight now at the Supreme Court. Bloomberg San Francisco Bureau Chief Kara Wetzel with us now. Kara, what is the Supreme Court debating? And what signals are we getting about which way the justices are leaning? So the Supreme Court is debating an order by the Biden administration and OSHA that would require employers with at least 100 employees to uh, have their workers vaccinated or have them test weekly, either at their own expense or the companies paying for it and having to track that information. So uh, various groups, uh, industry groups and governments have argued against this, saying it's too onerous, and they've taken it to the Supreme Court, and which is kind of leading in the direction based on the arguments given today uh, toward indicating that they will uh, strike this down. Uh, less, you know, because of concerns about the, prom the idea that companies can provide vaccine mandates themselves, but more of like, is this a responsibility of the federal government versus the state government? So, so that's the way it's been leaving. This court's actually been pretty receptive to mandates in general, but it's an issue of whether they think the Biden administration has the right to implement this kind of rule for companies. Do these rules being rejected, if they are, doesn't that make it harder for companies to enforce vaccine mandates? Well, it's really up to the companies. You know, they are able to do it. As I said, you know, the courts have held up the idea that, you know, you can do a broad vaccine mandate. Uh, as of now, though, it, you know, it looks like a lot of companies have been waiting to see how this all plays out because it's been, you know, thrown into legal questions since it was announced several months ago. Uh, they were supposed to take effect Monday, and a lot of companies have just been in wait and see mode. Uh, one study said about 30% of companies said they'll do, only do a mandate if the OSHA rules go through. So that will be a big question mark. You know, in some ways, it's better for companies to have the cover and saying we have to do this because the government is telling us to do it. And now, you know, they'll have to be left to navigate that on their own as if, to, if they want to do it or not. Citigroup, meantime, making it a strict requirement that you got to be vaccinated. Why are we looking at that vaccine mandate in particular? Citigroup has one of the strictest uh, mandates on Wall Street saying that if you aren't you know, can't show proof of vaccination or get an exemption, you're out of a job. This is notable because, you know, on 
few companies have actually gone that far. More, more companies have said you may have to be vaccinated to go into the office. Notably, we've had companies like United and Tyson Foods uh, say, you know, have the no vaccine, no job mandate. But Citigroup uh, is the biggest among the banks to go ahead and do so. And it's really, you know, an example of a sprawling company. It's got, uh, you know, not just bankers in Manhattan. It has workers at local branches across the country. It has back office workers in places like Florida and Texas where there might be a little bit more vaccine hesitance. So it's really a marker of you know a broad, big U.S. company coming out and saying that you have to comply with this rule. And so far, you know, they say more than 90 percent have their deadline, their first deadline's approaching next week. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see the type of compliance they have and what sort of pushback there is. All right, Kara Wetzel, thank you for those updates. Lots to continue to follow. Later on, we're going to talk with a former teacher and the co-founder of Reach Capital about the school closure debate and what it means for EdTech. Taking a look at some other news, the biggest annual video game expo in the U.S. has now been canceled. E3 called off the conference five months in advance ahead of its normally scheduled time in June, citing COVID concerns. The Entertainment Software Association, which organizes the conference, didn't say whether it'll hold an online event this year or not. And GameStop is jumping on the NFT bandwagon. Bloomberg has learned its plans to launch a marketplace as well as a crypto partnership by the end of the year. Over the last few months, GameStop has hired about two dozen people to focus on crypto. This is the company looks more to digital sales rather than its stores. And coming up, we're going to take a look at the home flipping business. In particular, how the likes of Zillow and Open Door are flipping properties to some of the biggest names in global finance and what that means for average home buyers. Next. And as we head to break, I want to take a look at Sonos shares jumping the start of Friday trade. This following a ruling by the U.S. International Trade Commission that Google must stop importing phones, smart home devices, and laptops that are using Sono patented inventions without permission. The products affected weren't listed in the order, but the case involved a range of Google products with sound systems, including the Nest Hub and Pixel smartphones. This is Bloomberg. Much has been said about Zillow shutting down its home flipping operation last year, but with the company's efforts to sell off its inventory of thousands of homes, this has highlighted a little-noticed truth about the business called iBuying. I want to bring in Noah Buhire for Bloomberg's Big Take. And Noah, how exactly does iBuying work and what does it mean for average buyers? Yeah, so iBuying is a business model that's, that's cropped up in the last couple of years. And, and basically what happens is tech companies like Zillow and Open Door and OfferPad use algorithms to make uh, instant cash offers for uh, people's homes. And uh, it's been really popular during the pandemic. Uh, it helps people avoid having to have an open house. It gives them a certainty of closing. And uh, it's, it's really grew rapidly this last year. Just in, in the third quarter, those three companies bought more than 27,000 homes uh, across the U.S. Um, and had more than $10 billion in inventory on their balance sheets at the end of the third quarter. Um, what uh, I was interested in looking at with some colleagues is what happens next. Uh, the iBuyers are, are flippers. They uh, uh, don't want to hold these homes on their books for very long. And oftentimes what they're doing is just listing them on the market. Normal people can come in and buy them. But uh, what uh, we found through our research and by looking at more than 100,000 property records is that they're flipping uh, a pretty staggering number of these to institutional landlords, and particularly Wall Street-backed companies that buy homes and uh, offer them as rentals. What does that mean for average home buyers or potential buyers? Is there no inventory? Are prices higher? Or they just can't get these homes? Yeah, it's a, li a little of all of those things. Uh, this is happening, you know, while it's a relatively small and fast-growing business, it's happening, uh, it's really concentrated in a couple of Sunbelt markets, um, places like Atlanta and Charlotte. And, you know, these are fast growing cities where there's already uh, a shortage of inventory, especially among 
the lower priced homes that would uh, give people who are buying their first home a chance to get into the market. And so the worry that um, researchers and other folks we, we spoke with uh, told us is that some of these homes are, are just making it that much harder for people to get into the market. The other thing that's worth noting is that some of these homes that are getting sold to big investors are never even being listed on the MLS, which is uh, where most people go to, to find a home. So it's, they're just completely bypassing the market and uh, going from often you know, normal people to the eye buyer to a big institution. Is there a place to lay blame here? Is it Zillow? Is it Open Door or OfferPad or something else? I, look, I think this is a feature of the business model that they've set up. They're trying to provide a convenience to home sellers. Home sellers are taking those bids. At the same time, there's an incredible amount of rental demand in our country, especially for single-family homes. So what you're really seeing is the confluence of two business models that uh, are overlapping in pretty dramatic ways in a couple of places. How is the pandemic influencing this? Obviously, we're seeing trends in home buying and selling and population redistribution that we've never seen before. Yeah, look, I, I think the iBuyer's pitch is more appealing because we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's, it's, a, it's a convenience for home sellers, but it, it also, like I said, allows a, a seller to not have to host open houses. Um, uh, by the same token, uh, these single-family rental companies uh, are, you know, have record occupancy right now because a lot of us right now want – the room that is afforded by having a whole house to yourself rather than an apartment. All right, Noah Buhire, really important read, Bloomberg's big take of the day. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Meantime, T-Mobile capped its biggest ever annual gain by beating Wall Street estimates for fourth quarter growth. The second largest U.S. carrier reporting 1.8 million new customers in the final months of the year, still, T-Mobile predicts an industry slowdown in 2022. Carriers are moving away from the free phone promotions that led to a frenzy of signups. Coming up, we're going to have much more on Bitcoin's volatility this week. And it is not a new phenomenon. After reaching a record near 69,000 in November, the flagship cryptocurrency has been struggling ever since. We'll talk about where Bitcoin goes from here. Next, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to financial markets and take a look at what's going viral. Bitcoin has been trending on and off all week and earlier dipped below 41,000. Our Ed Ludlow here with the latest. Ed, has, yeah, so the Bitcoin's crypto been winter, under pressure. has the winter already started? Yeah, Bitcoin's under pressure, right? The first sort of week of trading in January, we're down, we dip below 41,000. What's everyone talking about on Twitter? Hoddle. Bear with me. Hold on for dear life. Mr. Director, bring up the video. Let's see what we're talking about here. It's this idea that if you hold <laughs> Bitcoin, <laughs> it's OK, because it's going to bounce back. This is the theory. So you have users out there, owners of these tokens, that are saying, don't sell. Just hold on. This is what the hodlers are saying. Lots yeah. of hodlers casting shade on the sellers. Exactly. And there's some data to back this up, Emily, right? Because we know that volumes are down on the main, major exchanges for cryptocurrencies. We know that transactions are down. So there is some justification in that. The question is, are they right? Is, is buy the dip the right call? Is it? 
Come and meet us by Bloomberg Terminal. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at this chart. Because the other thing that we're talking about on Twitter in terms of going viral is the technicals. You have to remember it's a really sophisticated community that tracks Bitcoin. Look at those two red lines, the range $40,600 to $43,000. This is the so-called zone of interest, polarity zone of interest. The lower bound, the bottom red line, this is what we watch for. Because when we've dropped below that line, $40,000, $600, we've continued to see declines, further drops. It was interesting to hear Mike Novogratz, who previously said 42000 was the bottom, come out on Friday and say, eh, actually, 38000 40000 might be the bottom. We'll have to see where it goes. All but right. that's what we're talking about. Well, if you didn't know what holding was, now you do. Thanks, you, Ed. And speaking of Bitcoin volatility, just what is behind these big bubbly swings, Bloomberg's Eddie Vanderwall explains. Just what makes Bitcoin rallies so explosive? When Bitcoin goes up, it goes up like a rocket. Its rallies are spectacular, with prices often jumping several thousand percent in a year. And the crashes are sometimes equally spectacular. But just what is it that makes Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies more generally so uniquely prone to manias that send prices soaring parabolically? First, the supply of Bitcoin has no relationship to the demand. Unlike classical goods and services studied by economists all the way back to Adam Smith, an increase in demand isn't met by an increase in supply. That's because the algorithm that dictates how Bitcoin works has prescribed a set rate of increase. When the price goes up, the mining capacity dedicated to the Bitcoin network increases and the difficulty of mining adjusts upwards, but the rate at which Bitcoin is mined doesn't increase. Second, and for this reason, when Bitcoin's demand outstrips new supply, the increases in price drive excitement. Headline writers and newspaper columnists find breathless adjectives to describe what's happening. That makes more people aware of the gains and more money flows in. And that makes Bitcoin a Veblen good. Unlike a normal good, demand for Veblen goods rise as their price rises. Higher prices beget higher prices. Until, of course, the mania becomes so big that the bubble bursts and the rally pops. Except that in the case of Bitcoin, every bubble that popped was eventually followed by another bubble. I like to think of it as a kind of rubber bubble, one that inflates and deflates over and over again. I'm Eddie van der Walt. This is Decrypted. For more content like this, follow us on your favorite platforms. Love some Eddie Vanderwall. Thank you, Eddie. Now, is a crypto winter upon us? Some investors are betting that rising interest rates and a tech swoon will also take a toll on crypto investing. Let's ask my next guest, Hasib Qureshi, who's a managing partner at Dragonfly Capital, a global fund that wants to bring crypto to the masses. So I'm just guessing, Hasib, here, but I assume you're hodling rather than not. Uh, that is correct. We are we are definitely hodling. <laughs> I think you know, anybody who's looking at what crypto was doing last year was expecting that if and when interest rates rise, there's going to be a response in the total demand for crypto assets. Um, but I don't think I, I think looking at the effects of interest rates on crypto in the short term is very different from saying where do you think this asset class is going in the long term. Okay, so are we in for a winter that's just going to last a few months or a few years? Well, look. If, 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 if anybody knew in advance when winter was going to come or not going to come, then they'd be a lot richer than I am, unfortunately. Uh, the reality is that most people, when they try to call these things, they, they end up being quite wrong. There, there are some things that are really overhyped right now in the market, and there are some narratives that really need to prove themselves before they can really be uh, taken, you know, before they can justify the valuations that they have today. But it's very clear that there have been a lot of secular trends, most of which have been accelerated by COVID over the last two years, that crypto is really tapping into. And the, the, the hordes of institutional investors that have started to buy crypto over the last couple of years, um, most of them are not going to go away just because the price has come down you know, 15, 20% from the highs. Um, you know, overall, within growth assets as a category, we've seen a broad pullback over the last six months, right? It's happened in traditional equities. And now that institutional investors both have exposure to traditional equities and to crypto, overall, when interest rates rise, 
there's a decreased demand for growth assets and uh, because people want to move into safer assets because they because they pay more. Uh, and that's what we're seeing right now happening in crypto. But it's, it's a far cry from saying that, okay, well, it's all over. Uh, it's definitely not all over. Um, but it's just that the, the, the pricing of crypto is naturally associated with the pricing of other risk assets. Meantime, we're expecting rates to rise, potentially. That's impacting big tech. We're also expecting more regulation. Bloomberg reporting that the Biden administration might require uh, companies, crypto companies, to report customer data to the IRS. How do you think that's going to impact the broader market? I mean, in general, the, the, the regulation that we see coming to crypto is mostly what we expected, right? I don't think anybody who's in this space very long was expecting that it's going to be the Wild West forever. The, what, what I'm much more concerned about is not the kind of gradual march of, okay, you know, there's a tighter integration between exchanges and the IRS and people who are trading on centralized exchanges need to report their taxes. Like, of course, that's going to happen. Um, the real question I think that uh, is, is on my mind is, are we going to see any sudden changes in that regulatory story that are unanticipated? Right. So, you know, Gensler uh, at the SEC, he's been banging this drum for a while that he feels that, you know, crypto and DeFi on the whole is, you know, illegitimate and or, you know, everything in crypto is potentially a security. Uh, now, clearly many people don't agree with him. Uh, even people within the, the administration don't agree with him. Uh, and certainly a lot of people, you know, a lot of people in Congress who ultimately are, are very likely going to be the ultimate determiners of how this stuff gets regulated. Um, but if we see a big shift in sentiment, whether it's on, you know, the, the status of many of these tokens, whether it's on the way in which DeFi protocols are going to be regulated, whether it's on, you know, the, the status of stable coins and whether or not stable coins can be treated the way they are today with any address anywhere owning a stable coin. If any, we, if we see a secular shift in the regulatory approach in the U.S., uh, that's what has me more concerned than the more gradual stuff that you're talking about that I think um, one way or another was, was bound to happen eventually as this space became institutionalized. Andreessen Horowitz just raised $9 billion, a huge fundraise. Some of that will go toward crypto. And there does seem to be an oversupply of funds going into the crypto market. Is this efficient? And are you seeing it drive real innovation? Are you seeing it put towards really potentially useful products? 30 seconds. Yeah, so there's a, there's a barbell right now. You're seeing a lot of funds coming into the late stage, uh, you know, sort of growth investing, right? So you're seeing SoftBank, KOTU, Tiger, you know, Andreessen, Paradigm. Um, and that's where a lot of this capital is going is in the very late stage investments, right? If you're raising a $3 billion plus fund, the only place you can really put it to work is in late stage uh, uh, growth rounds. Um, you know, Dragonfly, we're much more early stage investors, and that's where we do our bread and butter. It's where we make most of our, uh, uh, you know, most of our really great investments. And in the early stage, I still see a ton of opportunity. There's so much, there's so many problems that need to get solved in crypto two to three years down the road before this stuff really attains mass adoption on the scale of hundreds of millions of users. And that's where I think the opportunity is still very ripe. All right. Asif Qureshi, Managing Partner at Dragonfly Capital. Thank you for joining us. Coming up, emotions boiling over in Chicago. We are standing firm and we are going to fight to get our kids back in in-person learning. This is more than 330,000 children are out of school for a third straight day. The issues facing the public school system, not unique to Chicago. We'll talk to a teacher turned ed tech investor and weigh in on this raging debate. This is Bloomberg. For a third straight day, classes at the third largest school district in the country are canceled. A battle is ongoing between the Chicago Public School Teachers Union and the city over safety concerns as the number of COVID cases continues to rise. It's an issue facing many districts across the country as educators struggle with how to teach while keeping everyone safe. Joining me now, Jennifer Carolyn, a Chicago native and also a former teacher who is now the general partner and co-founder of Reach Capital, which focuses on ed tech at all grade levels. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. So as not just a former teacher, but a former teacher in the Chicago suburbs, what's your reaction to what's happening in Chicago right now? Thanks for having me on, Emily. Really appreciate it. Um, I think it's I think it's really, really sad all around. Um, this is 330,000 students that are going to be out of school again. Um, across the country, there's 
5,000 schools are closed due to COVID issues. And this is um, at a time when the students have suffered a lot already with mental health and unfinished learning and, and other issues. So it's, it's very challenging. Everyone wants to lay blame somewhere. You know, parents might blame teachers. Teachers might blame the system. Do you see someone to blame? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I, I, I don't, I, I think it's, a lot of people are pointing, pointing fingers at the unions right now. Um, I do think that the, the teachers have a extremely challenging job right now, and it's, it's simply unsustainable, um, their jobs right now. So I, I do feel that the, the, the teachers are under just so much pressure. 77% of them are women. They are struggling with their own child care issues. Um, they're, they're having their own challenges with COVID. And I think that, you know, they, they are not to blame during, during this time. And what they need right now is our compassion and empathy, not, not blame. They need our support. So what do we need to do to address first the teacher crisis and then the crisis that involves getting our kids back into in-person school? Sure. So, so teacher shortages existed long before COVID. Um, the pandemic is really just bringing to the surface um, these challenges that have existed in the system for a, for a long time. The system has been stressed, and now it's we're really seeing how um, it's breaking the system. So over the years, the demands on the teachers have grown to levels that are just cannot continue. So they have very long work days. They are expected to communicate with parents 24-7. Their jobs are basically um, inflexible, so it's hard for them to even go to the bathroom during the day, much less a doctor's appointment or a dentist's appointment. They're underpaid. The average teacher makes $57,000 a year. Substitute teachers about $13 to $15 an hour. Um, so I think that there, there really needs to be leadership at the state and federal level to get behind our teachers right now, pay them more to in, increase um, their incentives and working and better their working conditions. So what about the kids and this mental health crisis? It is so, so scary and school is, you know, a lifeline for, for children across the country. Would being in the classroom physically, would it solve all these problems? Well, it's certainly better for, for the children. Um, we know that the, the children's mental health has been suffering for, for, for a long time, for years before the pandemic. And the pandemic really accelerated um, the mental health issues of our, of our children, especially our teens. So the, you may have seen the, the Surgeon General came out with an advisory um, about the mental health crisis for our teens. One in three high school students ex are experiencing persistent feelings of sad, sadness and hopelessness. Um, I think it's really a time that we need to take a closer look at, at our children and what types of supports and services that we are providing for them. We know that, that kids need social interaction. They need to be amongst each other. And some of the research that's coming out about the deleterious impacts of the, um, the pandemic on, on teens, especially high schoolers, is that they suffered from not being amongst each other, not having time to interact with one another. When sports mm -hmm. were canceled, activities canceled, that's what has really negatively impacted them. And it's most critical for the, the students that um, are, are most vulnerable, that right. are from the, the lowest income neighborhoods. What does this mean for education technology, which you know, Reach Capital has been investing in for a long time, since long before the pandemic? And we were all so grateful for it when the pandemic started, but the pet skeptics say, you know, virtual learning now, it's just not enough. Yeah, there, there's just no question virtual learning is, is not where, where it needs to be. And, and I experienced that with my three kids during, during the pandemic. And many you know many families were, were frustrated by the the existing solutions out there i'm encouraged that there is more attention more money more investment going into um, venture capital in education technology right now and i think that will help create better solutions long term but there are very exciting um, areas and solutions that that ed tech is um, that is really improving right now for, for students. Um, and some of the areas that I'm most excited about are ways in which we can support teachers better and reduce their burdens and really help offset this labor shortage. So where are you placing your bets as we look ahead quickly and knowing that the pandemic is in you know, some way, shape or form going to drag on? 
Yeah, so um, we're investing from preschool, K-12, higher ed, lifelong learning, um, and some of the areas that I'm most excited about and focused on are things that are uh, aimed at the teacher. And the teacher's, the teacher's job being so challenging as it is, what are some tools and ways that the teacher doesn't have to do it all, that we can really bring a village of supporters and uh, content and support around the teacher and in the classroom. So we've invested in um, live online marketplaces like OutSchool, which uh, provides uh, on-demand online and scheduled classes for, for students. And we're also looking at, at issues like mental health and how can we better support schools um, to diagnose and to understand wh who are the students that, that need help. Okay, Jennifer Carolyn. Reach Capital co-founder, thank you for joining us on this and wading into um, what's been a very emotional debate. Appreciate you taking the time today. Coming up, Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit taking flight on the NASDAQ as the space launch operator prepares for new missions in 2022. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Virgin Orbit heading skyward. The commercial space launch operator founded by Richard Branson started trading on the NASDAQ after completing a SPAC. It's just one of a number of startups launching low-level satellites. Virgin Orbit CEO Dan Hart spoke to my colleagues. The company planning a lot of firsts, he says, in 2022. For our company, we pierced the pandemic and drove a new technology into space launch. And what will we have to do? We've got to continue to do that. Um, in the last eight weeks, we penetrated the market more than we ever have. Um, we signed a deal with ANA Airlines for 20 uh, launches um, out of Japan. Um, we signed uh, agreements with new space technology companies like Hypersat for hyperspectral imaging of the Earth, uh, 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 Arcit, quantum encryption from space, uh, Spire, Boeing, other companies. Um, it's, uh, it's frankly a very exciting time for us. And what we need to do is continue to do that, and that's what we plan to do. We have a rocket that's in Mojave right now being ready for launch. Uh, over the next few days, we'll launch that. We have launches uh, coming f behind it. We have the first launch out of the UK coming uh, this year. Our system is unique in that we can launch from pretty much any airport uh, that can handle a 747 across the world. Um, Dan. There are different aspects to space. One is going to be deeper space exploration like Mars, one's the moon, one's space travel, and one is low Earth orbit. Um, and that's satellites that are closer to Earth. Uh, and that's really where the fundamental money-making ability is going to be. How, how big is that addressable market, Dan? Oh, the market for, um, for space, you know, is growing. Uh, overall space is growing to be a well over a trillion dollar market from about 400 million right now over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, so the forecasts are very strong. Low Earth orbit, small satellites is the, the, the strongest part of that growth. And our system is geared towards making sure they can get to the right orbit at any time to maintain the connectivity to, the, to their customers or from the national security point of view to do critical missions. Dan, is there a plan to evolve the business model beyond launching um, the, the rockets, the satellites from below a 747. Is there a, a different model that you could ultimately end up pursuing here? A and as an extension to that question, if not, do you see yourself in a different market, for instance, to SpaceX? So we have uh, reached into very unique markets. I mean, for instance, you know, I mentioned the UK. We can set up shop and, and give countries the capability to launch from their sovereign shores um, without them doing much except use an, air, an existing airport. There are environmental benefits to it uh, that ground launch doesn't have, as well as flexibility and affordability. Um, so, I mean, there are almost 80 space agencies across the world right now. Only about 10 countries have space launch. That's a huge business opportunity. Additionally, in national security, which is becoming more and more important, I mean, you've read about the, the Russian uh, uh, anti-satellite test, for instance, we can be available 
in case a satellite is threatened or damaged and put them up in a moment's notice. Hmm. And hopefully that, that disincent in, in, incentivizes aggression in space. Um, Dan, it feels like every company out there is trying to get involved in space uh, to some capacity. Um, recent Chinese complaint uh, to the UN about a SpaceX a Starlink a near miss with, the spa with their space station. How crowded is it getting up there and does that limit the addressable market for you? You know, the, what's needed in space really, and I think everybody is, is in agreement on this, is, is more international collaboration and cooperation and infrastructure so that we can do space traffic management just like we do air traffic management today. Virgin Orbit CEO Dan Hart there. Wall Street Week coming up next. This is Bloomberg.